So good evening all. Welcome everyone to the PG case discussion series uh, conducted by IRA Kerala in association with Yanomed. Towards this, I welcome Dr. Gomadhi Subramanian, President Kerala IRA, Dr. Rijo Matthew, Secretary Kerala IRA, and Dr. Emma Shenai, Program Coordinator. Today, the topic is um, radiological approach to GI hemorrhage, gastrointestinal hemorrhage, diagnosis and interventions. And this session is being moderated by Dr. Sunimol, consultant radiologist and academic coordinator, Kim's Hospital, Rwandram. I welcome Dr. Sunimol. And our expert faculty is Dr. Rajesh P. Nair. And he is specialist in diagnostic and interventional radiology. Jabbar Al Ahmad Hospital, Ministry of Health, State of Kuwait. Hearty welcome, Dr. Rajesh B. Nair. And now over to Dr. Sunimol for the introduction of the faculty. Good evening, all. I am uh, very happy to introduce today's faculty, Dr. Rajesh V. Nair, a young and dynamic specialist radiologist in diagnostic and international radiology, now at Al uh, Jabbar Al Ahmad Hospital, Ministry of Health. State of Kuwait. Regarding his uh, education and career, his, uh, he did his MBBS graduation from Government Medical College, Ernakulam, and uh, post graduation MD radiology uh, from JJM Medical College, Davangere, Karnataka. He obtained his uh, uh, DNB radiology degree and uh, after which he was working as an assistant professor in uh, Malangara Orthodox Syrian Church Medical College, Kolanjeri, for a period of one year. Uh, he is uh, passionate in teaching and has uh, academic interest. Uh, he served as assistant professor in Case Hegde Medical Academy, Mangalore. After which he did his one year fellowship in vascular and interventional oncoradiology from Manipal University and uh, served uh, at Manipal Hospitals Bangalore for a short period. Uh, he has qualified the uh, European Diploma in Radiology by the European Board of Radiology. He has a very brilliant academic career since his school days. Uh, he has uh, presented uh, many papers in national and international conferences. He has many publications to his credit. Now he is, as we mentioned, a specialist radiologist in diagnostic and interventional radiology. Uh, his uh, department has a, a, a very good uh, number of interventional cases also, and uh, he is heading the uh, department. Uh, I welcome uh, Dr. Rajesh to the to today's session and over to you. Zunima, doctor, I think there is some connectivity issues. I think Dr. Rajesh will be joining back. Okay. So good evening, everyone. And uh, thank you, IRIA Kerala, for giving me this opportunity to be here and present before you on the topic, Approach to GI Hemorrhage, Diagnostic and Interventions. And without further delay, let's start today's presentation and discussion. So what is the uh, definition of GI hemorrhage? It's nothing but hemorrhage into the lumen of the digestive tract. Uh, it is the most common medical emergency that leads to significant mortality and morbidity. And it is common in older age group because of the concomitant use of anticoagulants. And also uh, in older age group, malignancies, GI malignancies are more common. And not surprisingly, the male gender is frequently encountered with GI bleed because of the habit of smoking and alcoholism. And the most common cause of upper GI bleed is esophageal varices due to portal hypertension and cirrhosis. The incidence of GI bleed is around 40 to 50 cases per 10,000 persons for upper GI bleed, and the incidence of lower GI bleed is around 20 to 27 cases per 1 lakh population. The mortality rate for GI bleed is around 10 to 15 percent, and so it's surprising to note that 85 to 90 percent of the cases of GI bleed, they spontaneously resolve without any interventions. Uh, there are a wide range of investigations which are available today for that helps a major role in deciding the treatment uh, protocol for GI bleed. 
and radiology plays a major role in diagnosis as well as treatment of upper uh, uh, gastrointestinal bleeding. The treatment of choice usually depends upon the cause of disease. So typically GI hemorrhage is classified into upper as well as lower GI bleed, uh, depending upon the anatomical location. If it is proximal to the ligament of treats, it is called upper GI bleed. And if it is distal to the ligament of treats, it's called lower GI bleed. Ligament of treats is nothing but an anatomical structure that extends from the right crust of the diaphragm to the duodenal jejunal flexure. And anything proximal to that, that is from the stomach, duodenum as well as esophagus contribute to upper GI structures. And the lower GI structures is the jejunum ileum as well as the colon. So GI bleed can be classified into acute and chronic depending upon the duration. Acute bleed is usually less than seven days and chronic bleed is that which is more than 14 days duration. It can be massive or intermittent bleed. It can be anatomy, based on anatomical location. It can be classified as upper and lower GI bleed. And depending upon the clinical presentation, it can be occult bleed, where the bleeding is not visible to the naked eye, and overt bleed when the patient presents with hematemesis melina or hematochesia. So this is a graphical representation of the location of GI bleed and the causes. The most common uh, cause for upper GI bleed is peptic ulcer disease as well as bleeding esophageal varices. And the causes for those distal to the ligament of trees include hem diverticulosis, hemorrhoids, colorectal malignancies, intestinal AV malformations, as well as inflammatory bowel disease and ischemic colitis. So based on the presentation, it can either be visible bleed or occult bleed. The occult bleed is not visible and it is only detected during stool examination for occult blood, which is called the GUIAC test, uh, where you take a stool sample into the GUIAC uh, filter paper and you add hydrogen peroxide, it will change color. And most of the most important cause for a chronic occult GI bleed is usually a hidden malignancy. And the patient usually presents with features of iron deficiency anemia. So the most common feature to differentiate upper and lower GI bleed is the clinical presentation. The upper GI bleed patients usually present with hematemesis melina, and the lower GI bleed patient usually present with hematochesia. So hematemesis is nothing but vomiting of uh, coffee ground vomitus, where the blood is uh, mixed with the, uh, reacts with the HCL, which is produced in the stomach and it changes color and become, become coffee ground. And melina is nothing but uh, uh, blood, which is present in the gastrointestinal tract for more than eight hours duration. So technically speaking, melina, uh, it, it, we cannot differentiate upper and lower GI bleed basis on melina because both can present as the same. Whereas hematochesia is bleeding fresh blood through the rectum, that is, uh, that is an important entity seen exclusively in lower GI bleed. And upper GI bleed patients usually have elevated blood urea nitrogen. The other clinical presentation is hemoglobin drop. The patients usually have a hemoglobin drop of less than 10 gram per deciliter. Anemia is also a common presentation of GI bleed. If it is an acute GI bleed, the patient usually have a normocytic normochromic anemia. Whereas if it is a chronic GI bleed, the patient usually have a microcytic hypochromic anemia due to iron deficiency. They can be tachycardia with heart rate more than 100 per minute. Hypotension is a common feature with systolic blood pressure less than 100. Most of the patients usually require a vasopressor support. They can have reduced urine output and electrolyte imbalance, elevated blood urea nitrogen, and chronic, blood, uh, chronic bleeding patients usually present with uh, lethargy, dissonance, and pallor. The risk factors for GI bleed, it is more common in patients with chronic liver disease and chronic renal disease because of uremic, uh, uremic platelet dysfunction as well as thrombocytopenia associated with liver disease. And also liver, uh, the clotting factors will be abnormal in patients with liver disease. They can be seen in patients with GI malignancies, previous history of surgery, radiotherapy, patients on anticoagulants, uh, lifestyle associated smoking, alcoholism, et cetera, inherited coagulopathies, and invariably, bleeding disorder, bleeding, GI bleed is common in patients with helicobacter pylori infection and those taking long-term NSAIDs. There can be certain mimickers for GI bleed. Usually, hemoptysis may be mistaken for hematemesis, and also bleeding from the vagina can be mistaken for hematochesia. And ingestion of certain drugs can also lead to um, misleading presentation of melina. Usually iron and bismuth supplements, they can produce melanotic stools. And certain fruits and dyes can turn stool or emesis into red, purple, or maroon color. Beetroot. 
So distinguishing between actually the upper GI bleed presents with hematemesis and melina and the lower GI bleed presents with hematochezia. The lower GI bleed tends to be more indolent and the lower GI bleed tends to be more indolent and chronic, whereas the upper GI bleed tends to be massive and severe in presentation. Uh, high blood urea and nitrogen level is indicative of upper GI bleed, whereas in lower GI bleed, the blood urea and nitrogen tends to be stable. So the prevalence of GI bleed, the most important cause for upper GI bleed uh, is usually peptic ulcer disease with tops for 53% of the cases. And the next most common in varicose ble bleeding, which is seen in 11% of the cases. Other less common causes are Mallory Weiss syndrome. Mallory Weiss syndrome is nothing but in seen in patients with alcoholism, where they take alcohol and they vomit and retch. And during the episodes of vomiting, there can be a tear in the lower esophageal spincher, which is usually a partial thickness tear. And if it is, it's a full thickness tear involving the entire lower esophagus, it is, no, it is known as Borjavis disease. And the most important causes for uh, most important cause for lower GI bleed is usually diverticulosis, which is seen in 65% of the cases. And the next one is hemorrhoids, which is seen in 20% of the cases. Colorectal neoplasms usually account for 15% of the cases of lower GI bleed. So this is the pictorial representation of the various causes of GI bleed and the uh, and the usual diseases. In children, usually the most common cause of GI bleed is usually a rectal ulcer, or it is it's either induced reception or it can be due to a systemic disease like Henoch-Schroing purpura. In the older age group, it's usually due to diverticulosis or colorectal malignancies. And the most important age group is the middle age, that is from 20 to 40 years of age group, where the most important causes are yeah, peptic ulcer disease and esophageal viruses. The upper GI bleed is usually of two types. It can either be a variceal bleed or a non-variceal bleed. And uh, these are the causes again, which is, uh, which is again enumerated. So it is important to know these uh, like these entities. If, do you know what is the dulafoil lesion? Dula, these are all important causes of GI bleed. Dulafoil lesion is nothing but an abnormal vessel which is situated in the mucosa, and it can be situated either, either in the stomach or in the colon. And these lesions they tend to bleed. And Cameroon lesion is another important entity that can be asked in entrance exam. Cameroon lesions is nothing but an ulcer which is situated at the uh, ring or rim of the hiatus hernia, it's usually at the site of diaphragmatic impression. Where the diaphragm intends the hernia sac, they can be ulcerations of the mucosa and they can tend to bleed. They are known as Cameroon lesions. Then there are two important ulcers that you have to remember that is Cushing's ulcer and the next is Curling's ulcer. Cushing's ulcer is nothing but in patients with raised intracranial tension, they can be abnormal secretion of HCL and they can have multiple erosions in the stomach that can tend to bleed. Curling ulcer is usually seen in patients after a traumatic event in which they lose a lot of blood and hypovolemic uh, in hypovolemic states. Uh, and in those people post surgery, uh, post burns, or post severe trauma, when there is a blood loss, they can be mucosal ulceration with bleeding. They are known as curling ulcer. So, how do you approach to a case of GI bleed? As in any case, the initial assessment and history plays a very important role. Uh, past history of surgery and radiotherapy is usually important because radiation colitis can present as lower GI bleed. And uh, uh, patients with uh, usually alcoholic liver disease and cirrhosis, they tend to have multiple episodes of upper GI bleed due to varices. And also it is important to ask for the previous his treatment history, whether the patient had any history of treating varices or patient had any procedures for uh, portal hypertension and all that is important for treatment planning as well as for reporting the case that uh, cross-section imaging that you have got. The next step is usually the resuscitation, that is the area breathing and circulation. Then the next is the supportive therapy, and la uh, the final stage comes the investigation of the underlying cause. The laboratory investigations that are commonly done to evaluate a case of GI bleed, both for diagnosis as well as treatment, is the hematocrit, the CBC, the PTINR, which is very important. Most of the patients with liver cirrhosis, they have an abnormal PTINR as well as low platelet count. The fibrinogen level is also important. Most of the patients with bleeding, they tend to have an abnormal high level of fibrinogen. The liver and renal function tests, the blood urea nitrogen, and most important one is the blood grouping and cross-matching because there is no uh, replacement for blood than uh, like blood transfusion. So for grouping and cross-matching is very important. So this is a Glasgow Blatchford score, which is uh, useful to, uh, which is a score which can guide the patients in the ER when they present with upper GI or lower GI bleed to categorize them as uh, stable or unstable. Based, the score is based on the hemoglobin level, 
systolic blood pressure, heart rate, and blood urea nitrogen. If it's an abnormally high score, then the patient may need an ICU admission and immediate intervention. If the uh, score is very low, the patient can be monitored in the ward or can be sent back if it is stable. So how to assess the severity of bleeding? Uh, you cannot assess the severity of bleeding based on what you see outside. Uh, you have to do the laboratory investigations to identify how much is the blood loss occurring in GI tract. Because most of the bleeding can be occult and it is not visible outside. And whatever is visible outside may not be the true amount of blood that is actually lost. So hemoglobin loss of one gram in the last six hours is considered significant uh, hemoglobin drop, and that, those patients should either undergo a CT angiography or a catheter angiography. A blood loss of 40% of the blood volume is usually indicative of severe blood loss. The grades of hemorrhage is usually less than 15% is mild, 15 to 30% is moderate, moderate, and more than 30% blood loss volume is considered severe hemorrhage. The bleeding rate of more than 150 ml per minute is considered significant. And if the patient requires more than four packed RBCs in the last 24 hours, it's also considered a significant need. What are the treatment options we have for upper GI bleed? We can, if the patient is stable, we can go for medical option, medical treatment. If the patient is unstable, we can go for endoscopic as well as catheter-based in, catheter interventions. And finally, if the patient is stable and has a disease that needs surgical intervention, there are also surgical treatment options available. The investigations can either be endoscopy, CT abdominal angiography, catheter angiography, and nucleus integraphy. So these are the armamentarium of investigations that we have. And GI hemorrhage, you should know that there is no role for ultrasound and there is no role for barium studies. And the role for even MRI is doubtful because uh, we have, the studies have not shown any definitive advantage of MRI compared to CT. So again, these are the causes for upper and lower GI bleed. Uh, the, the neoplasms are an important group of lower GI bleed. They can be stromal tumors, adenocarcinoma, carcinoid, and lymphoma. It is an interesting fact to know that the right-sided colonic lesions tend to bleed more than the left-sided lesions. The most important causes for inflammatory bubble disease, ischemic colitis, radiation colitis, all, that, all these are the important causes of lower GI bleed. I will not be going into the features of all this because it's there in most of the textbooks. We'll just uh, press upon the major diagnostic criteria as well as the interventions that can be done in cases of GI bleed. So the medical management, if the patient has a significant GI bleed, usually an ICU admission is required with uh, vasopressor support and oxygen uh, supplementation. The patient should be kept NPO with nasogastric tube intubation. A large bore IV cannula should be Placed with fluid resuscitation started with crystalloids. It can either be normal saline or ringer lactate. And blood transfusion with PRBC is the ideal uh, uh, support to maintain the hemoglobin if it is less than 7 gram per deciliter because interventions require minimum of 6 gram per deciliter of uh, blood to be present because otherwise the perfusion of other organs can get affected during the procedure. And oxygen supplementation if it's required. And the older uh, tube, that is Sengen's taken Blake Mode tube, plays a very important role still today for management of variceal bleed. So this is the Sengen's taken Blake Mode tube. It is a double lumen balloon tube. It's a, a double lumen, double balloon tube, which is placed in the esophagus and it is used to control variceal bleeding. So you, here you can see two balloons. The proximal balloon is situated in the gastroesophageal junction and the, I mean, the distal balloon is situated in the gastroesophageal junction and the proximal balloon is situated in the distal esophagus and it is inflated and it will provide a tamponade to the bleeding viruses. And there is a lumen for enteric feeding also. So you can feed and aspirate through the tube and the balloon helps to provide tamponade to control bleeding. And the tube is kept in place via tension with the help of 250 or 500 gram weight. And there is a pressure monitor to measure the pressure within the balloon. So this is an effective emergency method for controlling variceal bleeding. The medications that can be used is you have to start the patient on proton pump inhibitors. Uh, usually pantoprazole is started at a dose of 80 milligram loading dose followed by a maintenance of 8 milligram per kg per hour. And pantoprazole infusion has been shown to significantly reduce incidence of recurrent bleeding and it can be continued for three to five days. The patient morbidity and mortality is decreased with the use of PPI. And for upper GI bleed, usually the variceal bleed, you can use vas vasoactive amines, usually the uh, uh, you can use uh, somatostatin analog, or which is called octreotide. It is usually used in a dose of 50 microgram per hour infusion. 
you can give a loading dose of around 150 microgram and then uh, maintenance dose of 50 microgram per hour infusion. So the most important modality for diagnosis as well as treatment of GI bleed is endoscopy. And this is done by the gastroenterologist. And now the endoscopic technique has usually evolved over the period, rapidly over the period of years. And it is developed in such a way that you can do even bedside endoscopy to control bleeding in ICU patients who are unstable and intubated. So for upper GI bleed, you can use an OGD scopy that evaluates esophagus, uh, stomach, as well as the duodenum. You should know that the endoscope cannot cross beyond the third part of duodenum. So bleeding up to the third part of duodenum can be diagnosed and managed effectively by endoscopy. The small bubble bleed is usually difficult to visualize either through the endoscope. So you have a video capsule endoscopy, which is just a diagnostic test. It is not a therapeutic. Uh, you cannot do any interventions using that. And for the lower GI bleed, you have the colonoscopy and sigmoidoscopy. So endoscopy can be diagnostic and therapeutic, and it is the test of choice for identifying and treating the bleeding lesion. It allows visualization of the upper GI tract, usually from the oral cavity to the duodenum. And the treatment can be injection of, uh, uh, injection of um, adrenaline, or it can be a thermal treatment based on uh, using coagulation uh, cautery, or it, you can use a, band, a banding technique or clips to control the bleeding. And colonoscopy usually evaluates the rectum to the cecum. And endoscopy, the timing of endoscopy is very important. Once the patient is resuscitated, endoscopy must be done within 24 hours of bleeding to for optimum results. The greatest benefit in uh, of endoscopy is seen in 20% of the patients with recurrent or continued bleed. However, the limitation of endoscopy is that if the patient is bleeding severely, then there can be so much of blood into the stomach or GI tract that it makes obscure. Uh, it, it makes visualization of the bleeding point very difficult. So mortality or morbidity is decreased by 30% in, uh, if you do an early endoscopy. And active bleeding can be successfully controlled in 85 to 90% of the cases. with less than 3% of complication rates for could be done within 12 to 24 hours of start of difficult in patients with shock and massive hemorrhage. Endoscopy is more in, uh, endoscopy is more used for upper GI bleed than So as an intervention radiology, I bleeds that one using thermal cautery. It can be both monopolar as well as bipolar cautery. And argon laser pla uh, argon plasma coagulation, argon laser plasma coagulation is used for treatment of angiodysplasias, which is seen in the elderly population. And if you have a pinpoint bleeding point, you can inject epinephrine to stop the bleeding vessel. And the mechanical uh, techniques include band ligation. Band ligation is used for treatment of hemorrhoids as well as varices. And or you can place a clip in cases of bleeding ulcers where uh, those clips are called endoclips or hemo hemoclips where the clips can be placed using the endoscope into the bleeding ulcer base. So these are the techniques uh, for variceal bleeding. Usually you can adopt for cautery, monopolar or bipolar. You can do a glue injection. You can do a coiling. Coiling is you visualize the uh, varices through the endoscope and then you puncture the varices using a needle and you inject coils through the needle into the varices to control the bleeding. And glue injection is you can use N-butyl cyanoacrylate. You puncture the varices and you inject glue that will stop the bleeding. For non-variceal bleed, you can use cautery, clipping as well as ligation technique. And for lower GI bleed, you can use clipping for, uh, for ulcers. You can use argon laser photocoagulation for angiodysplasia. You can use banding technique for hemorrhoids. And if it's the bleeding point, polyp, you can, use, you can do endoscopic polypectomy also. The technical success rate for endoscopy is usually 85%. It is more effective in controlling variceal bleed. As I told you, it's more suitable for upper GI bleed than lower GI bleed. Nowadays, endoscopic technique is more refined. It can be used in bedside patients after intubation in critically ill ICU patients also. The failure of endoscopy is seen only in 17% of the cases, and rebleeding after endoscopy is very rare. Now only 9.6% 9, 9 of the cases are seen. 
So what are the interventions that can be done for variceal bleed? I will give you a brief uh, outline about the interventions that you can do for upper GI bleed, uh, uh, a variceal bleeding due to portal hypertension. The most common of them is TIPS, which stands for transjugular intrahepatic portosystemic shunt. And then the next other, other technique is DIPS, that is direct intrahepatic portosystemic shunt, where you pay, place a sun di stent directly into the IVC from the right uh, IVC to the right portal vein. Then the treatment of variceal bleeding uh, to control the gastric varices, you can do BRTO, which is nothing but bal balloon occluded retrograde transvenous obliteration. Instead of the balloon, if you're using a plug, it's called PARTO which is called plug-assisted retrograde transvenous obliteration. If you're using a coil, it is called CARTO, which is coil-assisted retrograde transvenous obliteration. So it is very important to know the anatomy of the varices. The interventions for varices is usually restricted to gastric varices. You will not be able to uh, treat esophageal varices using any intervention no, other than TIPS. But for gastric varices, you can do BRTO. So the anatomy of the varices, varices are usually submucosal veins, which are dilated due to the increase in portal venous pressure. And the portal veins, uh, usually there are three afferent as well as efferent uh, connections to the varix. The varix are usually located in the region of the gastroesophageal junction. So the afferent connections to the varix are usually from the splenic vein. Because of the portal hypertension, the blood is not flowing into the liver. So it, di it gets diverted into these varices. The most important one is a left gastric vein. The second most important one is a short gastric vein. And then you have the small posterior gastric vein. These are the afferent connection to the varices. And the varices, they usually drain via small efferent channels into the systemic veins. It can either be the azygous vein or it can be the um, uh, systemic veins that drain into the lower esophagus. There are two main uh, shunts, two main shunts that can form in patients with long-standing portal hypertension to drain the varices. One is the direct uh, gastrocaval shunt, and this is draining the varix directly into the IVC. And the most important one is uh, drainage into the renal vein, which is called the gastrorenal shunt. So the treatment uh, principle for um, these kind of bleeding varices is you block this gastro uh, gastrorenal shunt, so, and then you embolize this varix as a whole. And what happens is that this efferent channels will get blocked automatically and the brain, uh, whatever blood is there, it gets flowed into the IVC through this gastrocaval shunt. So that is the principle of treating this gastric varices or balloon occluded retrograde transvenous obliteration. So this important is, this diagram is very important. The afferent channels through the left gastric vein, uh, right gas, uh, left gastric vein, short gastric vein and the posterior gastric vein. Uh, these are the efferent channel and uh, afferent channel is through the gastrocaval shunt and the gastrorenal shunt. So these are the types of varices which are seen in endoscopy. This is called the sarin classification. You have GOV type of varices and isolated gastric varices. Gastroesophageal varices type 1 is restricted, in, uh, restricted to the lower esophagus and it extends along the lesser curvature of the stomach, whereas GOV type 2 varices are seen along the greater curvature and the fundal region. Isolated gastric varices type 1 is restricted to the fundal region of the stomach, whereas isolated gastric varices type 2 are seen in the antropyloric region. You have multiple varices in the antropyloric region and type 2 IgG. So what is varix? Uh, the definition of a varix is dilated submucosal plexus of vein due to increase in venous pressure. It is usually seen as a complication of portal hypertension, either due to liver cirrhosis or non-cirrhotic portal hypertension. This is how the varices looks on CT. You can see multiple dilated serpentinous channels, which are surrounding the esophagus. They can be both esophageal mucosal varices as well as paraesophageal varices. The paraesophageal varices usually drain into the azygous system of veins. And these varices, they enhance more or avidly enhance during the venous phase of CT. And this is how the varices appear on a barium meal, barium swallow. You can see multiple dilated serpentinous filling defects within the mucosa. And this is an MR image showing the renal vein, left renal vein. You can see the gastric varices and the gastrorenal shunt. And this is an angiographic picture demonstrating the gastrorenal shunt and the embolization technique. So there are two types of varices. You have both uphill as well as downhill varices, depending upon the drainage. Uphill varices are uh, usually seen in portal hypertension, where the blood flows cranial to caudal direction. And the uh, uh, downhill varices are seen in patients with SVC thrombosis, where the blood is directed from the body, upper part of the body to the lower part of, through the uh, varices, so the uphill and downhill varices. 
and only the uphill viruses can be treated using the techniques which I mentioned. So coming to tips, which is the most important procedure in interventional radiology for treatment of portal hypertension. And it is usually done in patients. Uh, it is usually considered as a bridge to transplant. That is, these patients invariably will require a liver transplant. And TIPS is nothing but a stent or a tract which connects the right hepatic vein or the middle hepatic vein to the right branch of portal vein. So the blood usually flows from the portal vein through the stent into the IVC. So the problem with this is that the blood is not filtered through the liver and it gets directly into the systemic circulation. So the toxins which are there in the intestine are not metabolized by the liver and goes into the systemic circulation. So the chances of uh, hepatic encephalopathy are high. So the indication for TIPS is usually a patient with refractory ascites, a refractory right-sided hepatic hydrothorax, or a patient uh, with recurrent variceal bleeding. For the first and the second episode of variceal bleeding, the treatment is endoscopic ligation or banding. If that has failed and the patient has multiple episodes of uh, upper GI bleed with uh, significant hemoglobin loss and the patient is morbid, and you can go for a TIPS. The only disadvantage is that the TIPS is a very expensive procedure and you need a skilled intervention radiologist to perform this procedure. It takes around four to five hours if the anatomy is very tricky. So what you do is you enter the uh, through the jugular root into one of the hepatic veins. You can either enter the right or the middle hepatic vein and using a needle, we puncture through the liver parenchyma into the main right branch of the portal vein and you place a stent. The diameter of the stent is usually 10 mm and it is a covered part. It's a hybrid stent. The covered part of the stent usually uh, bridges the parenchyma uh, of the liver and the uncovered portion enters the right branch of the portal vein. And you should make sure that the left branch of the portal vein is left patent. So, and the blood will flow through the stent into the hepatic vein. And uh, you should know that tips cannot be performed in all cases of variceal bleed. The MELT score is an important score that calculates the prognosis after this procedure. You will, uh, most of the clinicians there, uh, they like they do not do tips if the MELT score is more than 18 because the chances of mortality are very high because tips, the tips procedure itself carries a lot of mortality rate due to the uh, due to risk of hepatic encephalopathy and the toxins getting into the systemic circulation. So can anyone uh, tell me what are the findings that you check for in a tips Doppler? The patient has a tips 10, what are the findings that you should look for in a tips Doppler? So you should import, it's important to evaluate the stent using TIPS Doppler because if the test stent is thrombosed or narrowed, then uh, the TIPS failure can occur and the chances of variceal bleeding are high. That uh, the flow through the stent should be very turbid and the velocity of the flow through the stent is usually between 90 to 180 centimeter per second. And so the diameter of the stent, the velocity of the stent, these are the things that you should look for in cases of uh, post TIPS Doppler evaluation. And if there is if there's any abnormality that you see in the Doppler, immediately refer to the interventional radiologist for tips plasty. Another technique in uh, cases where the hepatic veins are not easily accessed, where you have a patient with Bacchiari syndrome or the hepatic web, uh, hepatic venous webs, or you are not able to cannulate the hepatic vein, you can do a small short stent placement, placement called a DIPS or direct intrahepatic photosystemic shunt, where through the hepatic IVC, you place a stent into the right branch of portal vein. This is very similar to the TIPS procedure. I have shown an angiographic image where you can have passed a catheter through the IVC into the right branch of portal vein. Now coming to BRTO, BRTO is nothing but balloon occluded retrograde transvenous obliteration. It is used for the treatment of gastric viruses. So I told you the inflow for the varices is usually from the left gastric, short gastric as the posterior gastric vein, and the outflow is into the renal vein. So what you do is that you place a balloon catheter into the left renal vein and you go into the varix, and then you place a balloon to obliterate the outflow. Once the outflow is obliterated, you can see the varices nicely filling up and you can inject the contrast through the catheter and you can see the draining, uh, you can see the varix. So once this varix is identified, uh, there are a lot of classification for the varics. You can have a single inlet or multiple inlet, or they can have multiple branching outlets and all that. Whatever be the type, you can delineate the varics. Then you can inject uh, either glue or you can inject coil into the varics and completely obliterate it if it is bleeding. So this is a treatment option uh, preferred in cases of bleeding gastric varices, where you cannot control it using endoscope. So these are the angiographic images.
can see the left renal lane is cannulated and uh, you can list to uh, successfully embolize a catheter with a balloon at the tip that can, because if, uh, unless the outflow is occluded, you will not be able to demonstrate the verics properly. This is a very technically difficult and challenging procedure. And coming to evaluation of small bubble, as I told you, endoscopy cannot evaluate the entire small bubble. And uh, uh, luckily, the, small, the bleeding from the small bubble is seen only in 10% of the cases. And capsule endoscopy is a treatment, is, is a modality of choice to investigate the small bubble, and it's only diagnostic, and it can be used only in stable patients. However, capsule endoscopy is contraindicated in patients with strictures, diverticular, or small bubble perforation. Uh, capsule endoscopy is major and can be used only in stable patients because it will take at least and uh, the visualization is very limited in cases of capsule because only 20 percent of the gi tract can be evaluated and the most common cause for uh, gi bleed the most common cause for gi bleed uh, is usually the crohn's disease uh, from the small intestine and ct andrography can detect small level bleed in 85 to 90 percent of the cases and catheter angiography is the treatment modality of choice. So this is a capsule endoscope. Uh, the capsule is usually like a small pill with a camera fitted at one end with LED lights. Then it has a microchip battery as well as a transmitter. The transmitter is usually tied to the waist of the patient and the images and signals which are generated by the pill is usually transmitted to this recorder and the recorder is connected to the system and the entrologist can see the images. And fasting, overnight fasting is required for this procedure. The procedure usually takes around somewhere between 18 to 20 hours to complete. The capsule smoothly glides through the gastrointestinal tract. It is contraindicated in patients with strictures or the patient had any bubble resection or anastomosis or there is suspicious bubble perforation or if there is diverticular because the chances of capsule retention are very high. And the wireless recorder is worn around the base and the capsule is naturally excreted. And it provides a good quality images of the small intestine and colon. The advantage of this technique is that it is painless. It does not require any sedation and allows to make the doctor a uh, chance to see in, inside the small bubble lumen. So these are some of the images that have been uh, uh, seen uh, from the, it, it, it's uh, surprisingly a good quality images that have been obtained from the pili cam. This is how the normal intestinal mucosa looks like with the volvulic monumentis. And this is a diverticulum. This is the mouth of a diverticulum, which is seen in patients. This patient has multiple diverticula. This is how an angiodysplasia looks on uh, endoscopy. This is a patient with multiple after ulcers uh, in a patient with Crohn's disease. This is a polyp, which is pedangulated polyp, which is protruding into the lumen. And this is a patient with uh, irregular uh, mass, which is usually a malignancy. So coming to the mainstay of uh, imaging in patients with GI bleed, that is CT abdominal angiography. So what are the things that you have to include when you're given a case of GI bleed? You should include the site of bleed, the cause of the bleeding, the extent of the disease that is causing the bleed, the vascular territory, as well as any anatomical variations that can be seen for intervention purposes. The CT angi abdominal angiography is a non-invasive method of localization of GI hemorrhage, and it can detect GI bleed as low as 0.3 to 0.5 ml per minute. Actually, the sensitivity for GI bleed in CT angiography is much higher than that of catheter angiography. For catheter angiography, it can detect bleed only if it is around 0.5 to 1 ml per minute. The sensitivity of G CT abdominal angiography is 50 to 86 percent, whereas the specificity is 92 to 95 percent. It is contraindicated in patients with renal failure for the risk of developing contrast-induced nephropathy. The advantage of CT is that it is quick. It provides a rapid diagnosis. It is easily available. It is non-invasive. It is ideal for unstable patients. And it, it can detect even extra luminal pathology and helps to further manage the patient. We can take a decision for further management based on the CT alone. And CT has a higher uh, advantage of high spatial resolution and multiplanar reconstruction. However, the detect, uh, disadvantage is that it cannot detect slow or intermittent bleed. And if it is a slow or intermittent bleed, you have to go for nuclear scintigraphy. It uses ionizing radiation. The, it cannot be used in patients with contrast allergy, and it cannot be used in patients with renal failure. So the protocol for CT angio that is followed in our institute is first you take a non-contrast image. The importance of non-contrast image is that you can identify any hyperdense material within the bubble, like fecolith or some foreign body. Uh, 
uh, prior to injection of contrast so that there will not be any doubt whether it is extravasation or some other foreign body. Then you inject 1 ml, uh, 120 ml of contrast using a pressure injector at the rate of 4 to 5 ml per second. The arterial phase is obtained at 20 to 25 seconds, and usually you have, uh, you make use of bolus tracking technique. The portal venous phase is obtained at 50 to 70 seconds. Venous phase is usually obtained at three to five minutes, and there is no uh, usually there's no need of a delayed phase. And uh, KVP of 120 is used, and MAS of 150 MAS. You can use a 1 mm reconstruction slice thickness and a pitch of 0.8 mm. This is the protocol which is used in our institute. So CT and uh, angiography, how do you identify a bleed? So uh, the most important thing to look for is the hyperdense material within the bubble. So if there you see a hyperdense material, it is indicating of recent hemorrhage and that is called a sentinel plot. Extravasation of contrast is a hallmark finding used to determine the source of bleed. And the change in appearance of the extravasated contrast in the different phases, that is in the arterial phase, it will be of a particular density and shape. Then in the venous phase, the shape as well as the density of the extravasated contrast material changes, indicating that there is ongoing bleed. So CT angiography provides important information about the vascular anatomy mapping, as well as variants for endovascular, as well as intervention planning. So this is a CT abdominal angiography. There's a patient with, uh, you can see there is contrast extravasation into the lumen of the ileum, distal ileum. And this is the importance of multi-planar and as well as volume rendering technique. You can see that the branch from the SMA, the ileocolic branch from the SMA is bleeding here. And this is a volume rendered image. And I was able to demonstrate this exact image in the angiography also. You can see the SMA is cannulated. And after contrast injection, you can see there is bleeding into the uh, ileum from the ileocolic artery. And I successfully went in with a microcatheter and coiled this artery. So this is how the CT abdominal angiography, uh, CT abdominal angiography, uh, the various spaces help to detect a bleed. On the proximal row, you have a patient with, uh, she's a 37 year old female, status post pancreatic duodenectomy for a neuroendocrine tumor. And uh, was, uh, post surgery, she had a collection and we had placed a pigtail catheter for her. You can see the loop of the pigtail here. And after three days of pigtail placement, she presents with severe bleeding through the pigtail drain. And we uh, suggested a CT contrast for evaluation of the bleeding, and they found out that there is a blood clot. This is an unenhanced image where you can see a sentinel clot within the uh, lumen, and it, it, it is enhancing. There is contrast extravasation in the arterial phase, and the density as well as the shape of the material changes in the venous phase. So this is indicative of active bleeding. In the second row, we have a patient who is a 56-year-old female. She had a malignancy on the right colon, which was resected, and uh, there was uh, ileocolic anastomosis after right hemicolectomy. And at the anastomotic site, there was bleeding. The patient presented with uh, lower GI bleed and mel uh, melina. And you can see that there is a bleeding point at the anastomotic site, which is changing in shape during the venous space. Density as well as the shape is changing. So this is an active point extravasation. This patient also underwent uh, angiography and embolization. Now, coming to role of dual energy CT, most of the institutes, they have a dual energy CT now available, which can, uh, which, which, which is considered uh, like much more effective or superior in detection of uh, GI bleed. Uh, so the role of dual energy CT is that it requires both higher energy as well as low energy data set. The higher energy is usually 120 to 150 kVp, and the lower energy data set is usually 50 to 80 kVp. And in the dual energy CT, there are only two phases. You do not take the non-contrast phase. You only take the arterial and the venous phase in the, both the higher energy and lower energy set. Then using a material decomposition algorithm, you can detect that uh, uh, you can reduce the attenuation value of MH, iodine, and obtain a virtual non-contrast image. So from a contrast enhanced image, uh, you can subtract the iodine and obtain a virtual non-contrast images. And also iodine mapping and monochromatic data set aid to detect contrast extravasation. The advantage is that uh, using dual energy CT, the radiation dose to the patient is less, but uh, dual energy CTs are very expensive and it's not available in all institutes. So this is the principle of dual energy CT where you obtain an image with the contrast and based on the material decomposition algorithm and iodine mapping, you subtract the iodine from this image and then whatever is left behind in the pixel is the non-contrast image. This is not a true non-contrast image. This is a virtual non-contrast, which is called VNC. It is much more different than the actual unenhanced image. But nonetheless, it is very useful to detect uh, uh, GI bleed or to confirm whether it is actually uh, contrast material in the bowel or if it is some cal uh, calcium or some other material. 
So nuclear medicine has been evolving recently for detection of bleed, and it is usually used in patients with slow, um, intermittent, or chronic bleed. And usually there are two agents that can be used for scintigraphy. You have the Technetium 99M labeled RBCs, or you have the Technetium 99M colloid scan. And they can detect bleeding as low as 0.1 ml per minute. This is the most sensitive test for detection of bleeding, but it is not the most specific one. The half-life of sulfur colloid is usually five to 10 minutes, but that of RBCs is around 24 hours. They have a low spatial resolution, but poor anatomical localization. So these are two disadvantages. You can see the image. It will show you there is a bleed, but there is no resolution, and the, you, you may not be able to know which anatomical organ is bleeding from. And this, uh, uh, this carries a higher risk of radiation than CT angiography. It can be used in patients with risk of uh, allergy to iodinated contrast agent. And it is more effective in detecting lower GI bleed than upper GI bleed. It has a sensitivity of 95% and a specificity of 93%. Most patients with less than nine minutes time to peak will require a catheter angiography. So if it's less than nine minute time to peak, they are seeing a, uh, activity within the bubble lumen. Those patients usually when they do a catheter angiography, they, they, it will be, they will have a positive bleed. This is how the nuclear medicine images look like. The spleen usually uh, uptakes all of the technetium, so they will be appearing, uh, they will show some activity. And even the renal, uh, the collecting system and the bladder also shows activity after some time. The bleeding usually is seen as a focal area within the bowel that changes the shape with time. So here, this patient, you can see that there is bleeding into the uh, uh, duodenum actually, uh, which is increasing in the uh, increasing in subsequent delayed phases. This is another patient uh, with suspected GI bleed. You can see a faint uptake in the region of the cecum and that is rapidly increasing during the different phases. You can see at one minute it is very faint and 15 minutes it is very uh, high and it is tracking along the ascending colon. So this is a patient with bleeding from the cecum. So coming to digital subtraction angiography, which is the mainstay of uh, uh, diagnosis as well as treatment for GI bleed. So before that, let me uh, just familiarize you with the different anatomy of the angiograms. For uh, GI bleed, usually we evaluate the celiac artery, the SMA, as well as IMA. So this is how the celiac artery looks like. It usually arises from the space between T12 and L1 vertebrae. And immediately after origin, it has two divisions. The, towards the left, you have the splenic artery, which, is a torturous, which has a torturous course. And towards the right, you have the common hepatic artery. Immediately after the origin of the common hepatic artery, there is an artery that goes down. And this is nothing but the gastroduodenal artery, and it divides into the pancreatic uh, superior pancreatic duodenal artery as well as the right gastroepiploic artery. The right gastroepiploic artery is usually very thin, and the gastroduodenal artery is one of the most important causes for bleeding from the duodenum. Also. Then after, the, uh, after it gives off the GD, it is called as a proper hepatic artery. And the proper hepatic artery divides into the right and left hepatic artery. And there will be a small cystic artery, which is arising from the right lateral wall. Uh, the left gastric artery is a variable artery. It can usually arise from the splenic artery and supplies the lesser curvature of the stomach. Or in variations, they can arise even from the left hepatic artery. And the splenic artery usually supplies the hilum of the spleen. This splenic column of the spleen, as well as they can be short gastric vessels that supply the fundus. So this is an image showing the superior mesenteric angiogram. The superior Uh, it, it has a downward core. It usually supplies uh, most of the uh, mid-gut, that is the jejunum, ileum, as well as the right side of the colon. So you, here you can see the jejunal vessels, they are more closely packed, and then you have the ileal vessels, which are usually uh, uh, spaced. And then the larger first branch is the ileocolic branch, which supplies the cecum and the distal ileum. Then you have the middle colic branch, and as well as the, um, right, the right colic branch, as well as the middle colic branch. The last artery to evaluate in cases of low, lower, uh, lower GI bleed is the inferior mesenteric artery. The inferior mesenteric artery is the artery of the hind gut, and it usually supplies the left side of the colon. And uh, the first artery is the left colic artery, and it also supplies anast it also gives off anastomotic vessels to the middle colic artery. Usually supplies the region of the splenic flexure, descending colon. Then there are branches to the sigmoid and the rectum. The last branch is the superior rectal artery. The inferior and middle rectal arteries are not branches of the splanchnic circulation. 
Now, there are anatomic, uh, there are anastomotic communications between the SMA, celiac, as well as the IMA. This is the body's way of uh, protecting the bowel from any ischemic insult. If one of the arteries uh, to the bowel is blocked, there is still blood supply from the collaterals from the celiac or either the IMA. If the SMA is blocked, they can be collaterals from the celiac or from the IMA. Similarly, if the IMA is blocked, they can be collaterals from the SMA because of these anastomotic collection, the connections. The most important one is the arc of Riolan and the marginal artery of Drummond. The arc of Riolan and marginal artery of Drummond is nothing but an artery, arterial arcade along the mesenteric border of the colon, which connects the middle colic and the left colic artery. So this is an arterial arcade. It is a tortuous arterial arcade that communicates between the IMA and the SMA and pro provides collateral pathway for blood supply. The next one is the arc of Bueller. This is an anatomical communication which is usually present from the embryonic time connecting the foregut and the midgut. And it is a communication between the pancreatico duodenal gastro duodenal artery via branches from the uh, superior mesenteric artery through the pancreatico duodenal arcade. So this is known as arc of Bueller. There will be communication between the superior and inferior pancreatico duodenal ar artery and the blood from the celiac can flow into the SMA or from the SMA to the celiac, vice versa if there is a block. So catheter angiography is used in patients with active GI bleed who fail medical and endoscopic interventions. Angiography is able to identify active bleed when it is around 0.5 to 1 ml per minute. It has a sensitivity of 60% and specificity of 100%, positive predictive value of 100% and negative predictive value of 24%. It can detect only, the thing to remember here is that catheter angiography can detect only arterial bleed. You cannot detect venous bleed during a, using catheter angiography. And if you use digital subtraction, it removes the bone and it gives excellent images of the splanctic circulation. However, the image quality is usually affected by breathing. So you have to ask the patient to stop breathing to take a good quality image. Otherwise, uh, respiratory movements as well as peristalsis will hamper the identification of bleed. And you have to use at least four to five frames per second. Frame rate should be at least four to five for detection of bleeding. What is the principle of embolization? Whenever there is bleeding, they say, okay, refer the patient for embolization. What does embolization actually do? It actually reduces the blood flow into the vessel. It reduces the perfusion pressure, and it actually facilitates the clot formation using the body's inherent clotting system at the site of bleeding. So these are the array of embolization materials that are available currently in the market that can be used. The most important material that is used are coils. Coils are usually fibered and they're made up of nicotinol and they are of different sizes. You have O3-5 size as well as O18 size, depending upon the catheter that you're using. If you're using a mother catheter for embolization, you can use an O3-5 coil in the larger vessel. Whereas if it is a small distal vessel that you're embolizing, then you can go for an O18 coil using a micro catheter. Then stent graft is used in the treatment of uh, pseudoaneurysms. You can use gel form, which is a temporary embolization agent. Glue is nothing but n butyl cyanoacrylate. This is a permanent embolic agent. And PDA particles is used to embolize the capillaries. So the risk of uh, bubble ischemia is high if you use PDA particles in gel form. So the preferred embolic material for bubble is usually coils. So the dwell source of bleeding should always be considered in case of GI tract because there is always communication between the different arterial arcades. So the, it, the patient may not be bleeding from one uh, artery alone. They can be bleeding from multiple collaterals also, which should be kept in mind. So only when you embolize the major vessels that you can see that the other vessels are opening up. The clinical success of uh, taste is around 44 to 82%. So there are principles that you should follow when you're doing an embolization uh, of the bubble. You should embolize as close as possible to the distal bleeding point to avoid the risk of bubble ischemia. Suppose if you are bleeding ex ex exclusively from a pin point, you should go as distal as possible and embolize using a microcoil. And always, always, if it's an arterial arcade that is bleeding, you should consider front door and back door approach. That is, it is not alone that you place one coil at the site of bleeding, you should go distal to the bleeding and place another coil so that there will not be any black flow and a back flow filling of the arcade. I will explain this front door black door technique in a while. And if it is an end vessel and it can be sacrificed and you can sure that there is no uh, bubble, there is no risk of bubble ischemia, then you can go for uh, gel form or PVA particle. But as far as possible, we try to avoid it. Temporary embolization can be done with gel form. Then there is another term called empirical embolization. Empirical embolization is in which the patient is unstable and losing blood. And uh, they have tried to do an endoscopy and they have placed clipped at the site of bleeding, but they have failed to control. And an angiography, you're not seeing the site of bleeding, then you can embolize temporarily with gel form. 
clinical success is defined as when the patient does not have a rebleeding episode within 30 days of the procedure. The technique is very simple. You actually puncture the common femoral artery and an iotogram is usually performed with a pigtail catheter at a 50 ml contrast at 25 ml per second rate. And if iotogram will give you an idea of the major arterial anatomy as well as any anatomical variation. And for upper GI bleed, you usually cannulate the celiac as well as the SMA axis. And for lower GI bleed, you cannulate the IMA as well as the superior mesenteric artery. The cannulation is usually done with the help of a reverse facing catheter. You can use a five French sim or cobra catheter. The commonest source of bleeding from a gastric ulcer is usually the left gastric artery. So you can embolize the left gastric artery if it's a bleeding from the gastric ulcer. If it's a duodenal bleed, you have to embolize the gastroduodenal artery. Selective catheterization can be performed with a microcatheter and embolize using microcoils. As far as possible, PVA particles try to avoid because of the risk of mucosal ischemia. And arteriotomy is closed with the help of vascular closure devices. So complications of transarterial embolization is nothing but it can cause vas uh, vasospasm and dissection, chances of bubble ischemia, it can be non-target embolization, post-embolization syndrome, access site complications like hematoma, pseudoaneurysm, and fistula formation, and allergy to contrast material. Signs of bleeding in angiogram. Uh, what do you identify in angiogram and how do you say there is bleeding? You can say when there is active contrast externalization into the surrounding tissues. You can say when there is a pseudoaneurysm formation that is bleeding. You can see contrast filling in the bubble loop. You can see abnormal arterioles or dilated torturous vessels in cases of angiodysplasia. And if it's an AV malformation, you can see an early draining vein. So all these are signs of bleed. And then if you see any of these findings, you can proceed directly for embolization. So treatment of pseudoaneurysm. The most important cause of GI bleed is a pseudoaneurysm. Pseudoaneurysm is nothing but uh, it is a hematoma that is formed after a traumatic injury to the vessel wall. It is usually a complication of pancreatitis and the most common pseudoaneurysm, visceral pseudoaneurysm that is seen is usually from the splenic artery. So pseudoaneurysm has to be uh, treated using coils. And the pseudoaneurysm usually can have a, a forward flow as well as a backward flow. And if you have a stent graft, you can place, a, if, if you have a pseudoaneurysm like this with a narrow neck, you can either place a stent graft or you can place coils into the uh, cavity using, uh, using a catheter, which is called, uh, that is a treatment. In case if you don't have a stent graft, you can use a balloon assisted coiling if it is a wide neck like this. Narrow neck, the advantage is that the coil ten, uh, tends to stay in place within the cavity. Whereas if it is a wide neck, the chance of coil prolapsing into the vessel and uh, the vessel getting thrombosed are very high. Usually splenic artery, uh, pseudoaneurysms, they are difficult to treat because you cannot sacrifice a splenic artery. Uh, it will go for splenic infarction. So you need to, as much as possible, salvage a splenic artery. So usually place a stent graft or use a stent-assisted coiling. So this is a case of a patient with pancreatitis, a 50-year-old male, alcoholic male. You can see a giant uh, pseudoaneurysm which is situated near the tail of the pancreas. And in ultrasonography, you can see the classical yin yang sign. This is an endoscopic ultrasound image. And celiac angiography usually demonstrates this kind of a filling uh, of the pseudoaneurysm. And this was successfully treated with coils. This is another patient with uh, pancreatitis. You can see a large pseudoaneurysm here. And uh, this, uh, this was uh, uh, luckily for this patient, she had an accessory splenic artery. So we were able to embolize the whole aneurysm as well as afferent nifferent tract. So the importance of this front door and back door technique is that you should embolize both proximal and distal to the pseudoaneurysm so that there is no filling from either sides. If you embolize only one side, then there'll be collateral filling through the opposite end, which is open. So that is called front door and back door. Both the doors should be closed for the bleeding to stop. So this is a CT which is taken after the coiling. You can see the streak artifacts on the coil. So pitfalls and falls negative. Uh, you can, uh, there are cases in which they have called us for emergency embolization and we have gone in and we have seen the vessel and we have embolized. And the very next day we get a call saying that, oh, the patient is bleeding again, what to do? So that uh, these kinds of false, uh, false uh, bleeding can occur when there is a failure to cannulate the right vessel, when there is improper contrast injection, or when the bleeding is intermittent, or if it's a venous source of bleed, uh, or when you have an improper field of view. Many a times you can see that the field of view is so collimated that you miss the bleeding point. It may be away from the field of view. So it is always important to have a 40 inch flat panel detector and to open fully when you're taking an angiographic run. 
So rebleed following angiography, it's usually due to failure to treat the underlying coagulopathy. Most of the patients with GI bleed that I have come across is on multiple anticoagulants due to various uh, risk factors. And these patients, especially during the COVID times, they were put on high dose anticoagulants, and then they tend to present with uh, massive retroperitoneal GI bleed and all sorts of bleeding. And this uh, uncontrolled bleeding is usually seen in the elderly pe people. And intermittent bleeding is seen in those patients with uh, GI malignancies. So when there is a patient with re-bleed, it is better to repeat the endoscope and confirm the bleeding. And most of the cases, the bleeding can be controlled by, with the endoscope. Second attempt angiography is required only in 7% of the cases. The most common cause for a second repeat angiography embolization is usually a wrong vessel embolization. And, or, and the next important cause is collateral bleed. Now coming to important cases for uh, discussion today. I think I've taken a lot of time. We'll go through this. So this is a 54-year-old male smoker with recurrent duodenal ulcer. They have tried endoscopic uh, injection of adrenaline and failed multiple times. So this patient case with hemoglobin just standard with blood clots in the dependent portion. And in the arterial phase, you can see a small spurter here in the second part of duodenum. And this spurter is usually from the gastroduodenal artery. So we went, uh, we went into the celiac, we went into the gastroduodenal artery, and we were able to demonstrate the bleed. Because this is a uh, spurter and the gastroduodenal artery is multiple coils and uh, embolize the entire uh, gastroduodenal arcade. So gastroduodenal arcade embolization is not very risky because there is through the celiac and SMA. And uh, remember that posteriorly situated ulcers, they tend to bleed than the anteriorly situated ulcers. So uh, posterior ulcers are very common, a very close relation to the gastroduodenal arteries and the inflammation can erode the vessel wall and they bleed. The next case is a 77 year old female with lower GI bleed. She had a nucleus integraphy uh, and there was, a, uh, there was suspected bleeding in the right side of the colon. Uh, because the bleeding was very slow and intermittent, it was not uh, able to be picked up in the CT angiogram. But a catheter angiogram was done, and we saw abnormal vessels in the region of the right side of colon and the cecum. And this is a classical finding of angiodysplasia. In angiodysplasia, you can see abnormal tortuous vessels, abnormal looking vessels, abnormal change in the caliber of the vessels. All these are features of angiodysplasia, and the age group of 77 years points to this diagnosis. And it is usually seen in endoscopy, and these patients are managed by endoscopic argon laser plasma coagulation. But if this fails, then you can do a embolization of the uh, corresponding vessel. Here we embolized with gel form, and we also placed a small coil. This is a small coil, micro coil, which is called a 3mm vortex coil. So this is a 46-year-old male patient. The next case, presenting with ongoing GI hemorrhage, uh, requiring massive transfusion. The technician 99M RBC scan showed brisk hemorrhage from the duodenum. Here again, that was bleeding from the pancreatic duodenal artery. And uh, here the thing is that uh, celiac artery cannulation was done and we failed to identify the bleed. Whereas the SMA cannulation and injection showed that there is bleeding from the inferior pancreatic duodenal artery. And uh, we were not able to demonstrate any communication with the GDA. So we went ahead and embolized the inferior pancreatic duodenal artery in this case with coils. So this is another interesting case. This is a 72-year-old female with abdominal pain presenting with uh, lower GI bleed. The endoscopy showed a bleeding duodenal ulcer. And here you can see that there is a aneurysm which has involved the entire uh, GDA. And uh, we thought of like... Uh, we thought of placing a stent graft here, but it was not possible because the vessel is too narrow. And so we decided to coil the whole uh, uh, aneurysm here. So this is another 77-year-old female presenting with bloody diarrhea. CT abdomen shows bleeding from multiple diverticula in the transverse colon. You can see multiple diverticula here with contrast exacerbation. These are all multiple points of bleeding. Because there are multiple points of bleeding, the uh, colonoscopic uh, control of bleeding is very difficult. And this patient was referred for catheter angiography. You can see that there is extravasation of contrast into the lumen of the intestine. And we successfully embolized this using coils and gel form. And this was from the branches of the right colic artery. 
So this is another case that I've done. This is a 70 year old female with bleeding from the rectum. This patient is diagnosed to have angiodysplasia of the left side of the colon with multiple failed argon laser plasma coagulation. You can see that the vessels are still persistent even after the coagulation. So we successfully embolized them with a gel form. Uh, this is a branch of the left colic artery and we, uh, because angiodysplasia and considering the age of the patient, we thought, okay, we will embolize with gel form. And this, uh, this lady did pretty well after the procedure. So this is a uh, male patient with uh, chronic alcoholism and pancreatitis, a 56-year-old male presenting with hematemesis. And CT showed that there is a pseudoaneurysm arising from the greater curvature of the stomach with a large extra luminal hematoma and catheter angiography of the left gastric artery. This left gastric artery has a tricky origin from the celiac. It's usually an artery that as a right angle course, and it is uh, origin is also very tricky to cannulate, but we managed to cannulate the left gastric artery and we embolized the left gastric artery using coil. So intestinal vascular malformations are very rare causes of GI bleed. This is a case of intestinal vascular malformation of the small bubble. You can see an enhancing nidus here in the jejunum. And the superior mesenteric angiogram shows that there is a nidus with this prominent draining vein and we embolize this with uh, using uh, coils. Usually with intestinal vascular malformation, it is better to do a surgical resection than for endoscopic, uh, I mean endovascular treatment. Sorry, there's something wrong with my... The slide is not showing up. Um, so this is another case of left gastric artery bleed. Um, this was a patient with an ulcer that was bleeding from the left gastric artery, and we successfully embolized using a detachable coil. Because the left gastric artery was uh, hypertrophied in this case because of the long-standing ulcer, we had to use a uh, larger size coil for this patient. And another important cause for lower GI bleed is Meckel's diverticulum, which is seen in 2% of the patients. And this is an enhancing um, uh, diverticulum, which is uh, seen here in the CT image. And the corresponding angiographic image shows that this is arising from the superior mesenteric artery. You can see the diverticulum and the bleeding from that. The bleeding is usually because the diverticular has two types of mucosa, which is the pancreatic as well as the gastric mucosa and the combination of enzymes, they erode the mucosa lining and they cause bleeding. So Meckel's diverticulum is usually seen in 2% of the population just due to persistent vitiligo intestinal duct. It is located two feet proximal to the ileocecal valve along the anti-mesenteric border. And hemorrhage usually occurs in 30% of the cases of Meckel's diverticulum. And I told you it contained two types of tissue. And the detection is usually using technetium 99 pertacnate. And it is always uh, like, uh, it's very nice to know the rule of two. It's seen in two inches long, two feet proximal to the ileocecal valve, two types of mucosa, usually seen in children below two years and twice more common in males. So surgical management is used for those patients who are at low risk or stable patient and failed endoscopic management. And depending upon the uh, like the cause, if, if it's like Mallory V syndrome, malignancy, bowel ischemia, or diverticulosis, uh, with failed endoscopic management, the patient is stable, they can go for surgical resection. So for upper GI uh, bleed, they can go for partial gastrectomy, gastrogygnostomy, or vagotomy for peptic ulcer disease. And for lower GI bleed, they can go for colectomy, segmental resection, anastomosis, or hemorrhoidectomy, depending upon the cause. So these are the causes and the different surgical techniques. I won't go in detail. So conclusion, the catheter-directed endoscopic techniques are the treatment of choice if endoscopic techniques failed. CT angiography is the investigation of choice for GI bleed. Hospital mortality following GI bleed is only 13%, and chances of re-bleed re following catheter angiography, catheter embolization is 15%. This is an algorithm which is seen in most of the things. Last but not the least, I just like to discuss some points or like certain knickknacks from this lecture. 
So is this treatment true or false? Plain scan is mandatory in every case of suspected GI bleed before IV contrast administration. So there is a debate for this statement. Some institutes say that there is no need for a plain scan because it adds to the radiation dose for the patient. And other institutes say that without a plain scan, we are not completely sure whether there's bleeding or not. But in other institute, we have uh, evaluated and found that plain scan is not mandatory. Only the arterial phase is important to direct bleed and you have to take a venous phase also. Hyperdense tools can be readily differentiated when hemorrhage and CT. Uh, regarding this statement, it is uh, still debatable. Hyperdense tools, they say that I have come across an article that says that hyperdense tools have a lower HU value compared to that of uh, contrast extravasation in hemorrhage. All pseudoaneurysms should be intervened. This statement is true. All pseudoaneurysms, irrespective of the size, irrespective if it is bleeding or not, must be treated. CT angiography is the best modality of choice for evaluation of small bubble lesions. It is false. CT andrography or endroclysis using neutral contrast is the best diagnostic modality for evaluation of small bubble lesions. CT angiography is only used if you are suspecting GI bleed. The use of negative rectal contrast agent makes detection of colonic bleed easy. This is again a false statement. If you use a negative contrast agent, it will dilute the bleed and it makes vis uh, visualization of bleed very difficult. Dual energy CT is superior compared to triple phase single energy CT for detection of GI bleed. This statement is again false. Uh, single energy CT, triple phase is always superior to dual energy CT. These are my references. Thank you so much. Yes. Yes. Thank you. yes uh, that was an elaborate on theory and also some cases which, uh, uh, which Rajesh has uh, gone through and uh, some complicated cases also. Um, I'm just checking whether there are any doubts raised. Not so far. And uh, uh, doctor has uh, entered the session on time also, and uh, mm -hmm. have covered a vast uh, areas from the the complete GI hemorrhage has been covered. Anything to ask, doctor? Yeah, yeah, I think uh, uh, Dr. Rajesh. <coughs> He presented in and out of gastrointestinal hemorrhage. So all points have been covered, including the tips, uh, dips, BRTO and all. Um, only thing, um, it, it was a little fast. I don't know, um, a new resident no, or first year or second year resident, whether uh, the following may be a little difficult, but I think he was fast because uh, he had to include all the points in this one hour time now. So that, may, that could be the reason. Thank you, Dr. Rajesh. Uh, nicely covered and uh, explained everything beautifully. And uh, also shown some interesting cases. You know, lastly, some, a few cases. Uh, so this actually, these cases will be remaining in the minds of the uh, viewers you now. So uh, that's good. And uh, it's surely an exam question. And also for practical, the embolic materials and all. We already covered the, the last session we have covered. Still, the, this can be asked for practical and a very important topic. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rajesh. Thank you once again. Uh, now, I think, uh, uh, Dr. Sunimol, uh, we can conclude the session because we have to complete. In, I mean, um, uh, there's another program. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Rajesh. Thank you so much. In between your busy schedule, you have uh, committed to this and uh, you have done well also. In the future also, we expect your uh, cooperation and uh, more participation in our uh, academic sessions. Thank you.
Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Night. Thanks, Somia. Thank you, doctor. Thank you, Somia. Thank you, doctor.